going to talk about uh, surgical therapy of alpha-1 lung disease. And um, for state-of-the-art COPD therapy, and you can substitute in alpha-1 for COPD, uh, first thing, of course, is to achieve smoking cessation to prevent progression of the disease. Patients should then be on maximal medical therapy uh, to maximize bronchodilators, improve airflow. Um, from some of the things you heard today, I think augmentation therapy may be important in certain subgroups. Um, once patients are referred to us from transplantation, they're probably fairly far along, although some of you know that I will counsel patients to go on it to keep them stable enough while they're on the waiting list to make it to transplant or to decrease some of the infectious complications they're having, which might actually improve them to where they don't require transplant at that time. We also want to maintain oxygen saturation above 90%, so if you're supposed to be wearing it, wear your oxygen. Um, we're trying to uh, prevent you from being short of breath, allow you to exercise and to prevent the right heart uh, from developing what we call pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure. Um, we put everybody into pulmonary rehab. Um, that improves uh, their symptomatology and also improves their quality of life. We want people to be as active as they possibly can while they're on the waiting list so that things will go better uh, following the transplant or whatever surgical procedure we're contemplating. Um, <clears throat> to recognize and treat exacerbations, obviously that's important so that you don't get too sick, you don't go down too low while you're uh, waiting for your procedure. Um, I would add to this list, uh, confirm the diagnosis of alpha-1. Now most patients that are referred to us from transplant, they already know that they have it. But we see a number of COPD patients who are referred who have actually never been tested. And we will go ahead and test them either in pulmonary rehab, in the clinic, we'll call their doc and have them check it. I, the reason that we do that is that I think it's really important that we know who has alpha-1 and who doesn't for the post-transplant period. Because as you'll hear, I feel fairly strongly about continuing augmentation therapy or perhaps using uh, some of these drugs uh, as therapeutic agents uh, at certain times post-transplant. And then the last thing after you've gone through all of these, if you're still uh, progressing and you're in a certain range, uh, consider surgical options. These really come in two flavors. There's lung volume reduction surgery where we take out uh, emphysematous portions of the lung to try and decrease the volume of the lung to allow the diaphragm to move up and move into more of a mechanical uh, position where it's supposed to be and where it works at a, a much better uh, workload. The other option obviously is transplant. I will discuss liver transplant very briefly because it does have effects on the lungs as well. Uh, this isn't the, uh, that's all right, I can use these. So in the, in the old days, we, uh, we saw some patients who had what we call giant bulla. And this is a big air sac in the lung. This white stuff here is what's left of the lung. It's being squished and compressed. And this patient underwent a lung volume reduction or a giant bullectomy in this case. And as you see, look at the diaphragm here. It's now nice and rounded. It's moved up. The volume of the lung is much smaller than it was over here. And so we know from past studies that <clears throat> the diaphragm works better the heart works better through a variety of uh, uh, mechanisms. And overall, ventilation and uh, pulmonary function are improved following this type of operation. So this is the general idea behind doing the volume reduction, is to get the diaphragm, and since it was only done on one side here, it only improved on the one side. But we do it bilaterally through a variety of techniques. And that's to improve the muscle function, improve alveolar ventilation, we also found out that it also improves the function of the heart. And so this all allows patients to uh, exercise in a much better uh, um, state than they were before the surgery. Um, the rationale for lung volume reduction is that we know that emphysema is usually heterogeneously distributed in the lungs. A lot of times in the COPD patient, it's more severe at the top of the lungs, less severe at the bottom of the lungs, for alphas, you can flip that over. This tends to be a basilar disease, so the emphysema is in the bottom of the lungs, not in the top. But to me, it never really made sense why we wouldn't 
take the air out of the lower part of the lungs. So the, F the LVRS is designed for people with emphysema in the upper part of the lungs. But to me, volume is volume. So if you remove it spatially and the diaphragm is able to move back, we, we always thought that it would probably work for alphas as well. And then we surgically remove uh, the areas that are most severely involved. This, these were the original National Emphysema Treatment Trial Centers. As you can see, there's a couple in LA, one in Seattle. Here's National Jewish Colorado cohort. And then the rest of them were basically over here on the East Coast and uh, several right here in the Midwest. So these centers got together and um, after enrolling many patients, uh, we took all comers because we weren't sure who was going to benefit and who wasn't. We came up with a few rules at the end of the procedure. Um, so we found out that in, uh, compared to medical therapy alone, surgery improved exercise tolerance. However, in the whole group, there was no real survival advantage. So the patients were healthier, they could do more, but they weren't living longer. And the reason for that is that we found two groups. So the upper lobe group, who, who had low exercise tolerance as measured on an exercise bicycle, they were the ones that tended to live longer in addition to having improved exercise. The ones that had more diffuse disease and were able to uh, exercise more at the beginning, uh, we found that they had increased mortality and uh, a very minimal functional gain. So based on that, we came up with a group of patients that we thought could benefit from the procedure and patients who wouldn't benefit from the procedure. So most alphas have very localized disease down at the bottom of the lungs. So they would, instead of upper lobe disease, change this to lower lobe disease, low exercise tolerance, there's probably going to be a survival advantage and there's definitely increased exercise tolerance. What you can expect from this procedure is if you're on one to two liters of oxygen at rest, you probably will not require any at rest. If you're needing a little bit with exercise, you may or may not need it with exercise. It just depends on how much function you get back. Usually we see about a 20 to 40% increase in the lung function. So if you're sitting at 30%, most people will be up in the high 30s or even in the mid 40s, um, maybe up to six months after the procedure. Um, it does take time to recover from the uh, operation, but we found that uh, people continue to improve from six to 12 months. This is what we're basically looking for. You have giant lungs, you have flat diaphragms, you have a lot of air behind the sternum or the breastbone. These are all signs of hyperinflation, so there's too much air in these lungs. When we look by CAT scan, you can see there's hardly any blood vessels up here in the top. But you see a lot more blood vessels here in the middle part of the lung and a lot more down here at the lower part. So when we do a study called a ventilation perfusion study, which measures blood flow, you can see that the white is blood flow, the black is no flow. So what this shows us is that there's very little blood flow to the upper parts of the lung. So these are perfect targets to go after surgically. And uh, in this particular patient, uh, they had ideal targets up here. There's some emphysema obviously over here that you know there's always going to be some that's left over but the majority of the lungs still look like they had uh, plenty of lung tissue left uh, with which to deal with. Um, so that's typically how we do it surgically. There are now a number of uh, procedures that are done using these valves. <clears throat> there's one that kind of looks like a uh, bird's nest if you will. Um, it's slid into the airways and deployed. There's this one over here that has a one-way valve on it. Uh, some of these have come, come through clinical testing. Some of them have come to market. Um, some of us believe that they work. Other people believe that they're not quite so good. Um, I happen to be in that camp because if you put six of these in on each side in one portion of the lungs, there's also something called collateral ventilation where different lobes of the lung can ventilate other lobes of the lung. So if you block off one, you can ventilate through a bypass channel, if you will. So we much prefer the surgical option, even though it's a much bigger procedure, we think you get a better durable outcome from it. There was one other procedure where they went down and using heat, they would bore a little hole in the airway wall and put this little tube in, which then would uh, uh, decrease the amount of air and uh, empty this part of the lung. The problem with this procedure is that the blood vessel
runs right through this V. And uh, there were a couple of cases early on where there was a little more bleeding than you would have liked to have seen. So this particular device really hasn't come through uh, in clinical trials. Now, one of the advantages of trying to do uh, LVRS is that we realized very early that we could delay or prevent further surgical options, meaning transplant. And so what this slide shows is a group of patients that at time zero underwent lung volume reduction surgery. These two lines are the length of time that they then went on to where they needed a lung transplant or when they had to be listed for the lung transplant. Most of the ones that went on the list eventually transition over and they get transplanted. But what you can see from this, although some people got into trouble relatively early after the surgery, the vast majority of them didn't need to actually go on the transplant list until they were about two or three years after the lung volume reduction surgery. So we bought them several years of being able to exercise, maybe not being on oxygen, but we also avoided a lot of the immunosuppressive agents that we have to use to prevent rejection after a transplant. So the, the less time that you're under immunosuppressive therapy, the better off you're probably gonna do in terms of infections and overall health. You see up here that the transplants, they could be delayed for almost three years. And in fact, only 20% of the patients were transplanted within five years of each other. So the lung volume reduction can be used as a bridge, if you will. We can take people who are moderately ill, we can do the surgery on them that improves their quality of life, their functional activity, maybe gets them off oxygen for a while, but you still have emphysema, so you still need to take your medicines. Otherwise, you're going to continue to progress. But what we found is that we can delay uh, basically the option of no return. Um, once we transplant you, it's been done. We can go back and retransplant patients, but it can be a difficult operation. So if we can avoid that for as long as we can, we would prefer to do that, and the volume reduction allows that uh, stage procedure to occur. Um, you don't need to pay attention to this entire algorithm here, but basically when we see a COPD patient or an alpha, we measure their FEV1, if their function is less than 20%, then they probably are going to need a transplant sooner than later. We can either do a single lung, a single lung with a volume reduction on the opposite side, or we'll go straight to a double lung transplant. The program has evolved over the years, and we now prefer double lungs for most of our alphas. If your function is greater than 40%, or probably greater than 45 to 50%, we recommend continued maximal medical therapy, pulmonary rehab, as you heard one of the previous speakers mention, maybe augmentation therapy, anything that you can do to slow down the disease to prevent you from having to go down one of these surgical uh, algorithms. If you're between 20 to 40%, and I put up such a broad uh, range here because individual patients have different uh, physiology and, and differences in the severity of their disease. So if your carbon dioxide level on your blood gas is less than 50, and you do not have what we call pulmonary hypertension or high pressures on the right side of the heart, then we look at the, your CAT scan and decide, is it diffuse or is it heterogeneous like I showed you before? If it's heterogeneous, we would recommend an LVRS. If it's diffuse and your age is less than 65 and you're at the lower end of the spectrum on your FEV1, then we would push you over here into the transplant uh, category. Um, if you have high uh, carbon dioxide in your blood uh, due to muscle failure or severe lung disease, or you've developed secondary pulmonary hypertension, then some of it kind of depends on how severe the pulmonary hypertension is or how low the FEV1 is. We would push you again down this side of the algorithm to transplantation at an earlier time point. Um, now obviously some people, Say they're at 35%, they may have a little bit of secondary pulmonary hypertension. We can treat that with drugs and we can exercise you and keep you going. And uh, you may or may not come down this part of the algorithm. You may stabilize right around this time and you won't need any surgical option for a number of years. That would be the goal. So now I just want to transition to lung and liver transplantation. Where are we? I'm not gonna talk about the lung allocation system unless it comes up in some questions. Uh, 
expanding the donor pool. Yeah, I heard that laugh out there. So you've been through the battles with this before. And then liver transplant, alpha-related issues. So uh, for those of you who are not aware, we can either do single lungs or we can do double lung transplants. Single lungs are generally done for COPD and for people who have pulmonary fibrosis or scarring of the lungs. Double lungs have to be done for patients who are infected, like the cystic fibrosis population. We also do it for younger patients with COPD, people who have pulmonary hypertension, shown here in this bar. The alphas are shown in red. They're about 6% of the population in both singles and doubles. Some of it is programmatic choice. Some of it is um, age-related. Uh, there may be other issues where there was surgery done on one side of the chest that precludes surgery on the opposite side of the chest. So there's a variety of uh, things that go into the decision of the choice of the procedure for an individual patient. There's about 3,900 lung transplants being done worldwide in 2013. About uh, 3,000 of those are uh, being done in the United States now. And as you can see, shown in purple, the majority of them are double lungs versus the green, which is a single lung transplant. Now at the beginning, alpha is made up a fairly large percentage of all the transplants that were done. But because the number of transplants in 1990 was probably a couple of hundred, and now it's a couple of thousand, you can see that the overall percentage that are alpha ones has gone way down. But there's still about 150 or so that are being done every year uh, under the new uh, allocation system. If you look at survival by era, <clears throat> This is the early era from 1990 to 1998. You can see that the five-year survival rate was down here less than 50%. Um, in the midterm from 99 to 2008, it improved quite a bit to a little over 50%. We don't really have it for the new era yet because we're just coming through with enough patients. But what you'll notice is that um, uh, the slope of these lines is staying approximately the same. So that means that once we get people through the operation, um, we're pretty good at that. They generally do very well. Um, but there are still things going on out here that we may or may not understand that are contributing to ongoing mortality following the procedure. Now, as you can guess, the lungs are the only organ transplanted that's exposed to the outside world, other than small, bu small bu uh, bowel, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, so the lungs, you know, they're exposed to everything. Viruses, cigarette smoke, um, bacteria, dust, you name it, you inhale it, those can injure the airways. Airways are not very smart. In fact, they're fairly stupid. All they can do is get inflamed and scar down. There are all kinds of medical diseases that result in scarring of the airways. And chronic rejection following a lung transplant is one of them. You can't live in a glass bubble. You know, we don't want, you know, people that are walking around and, you know, tight-fitting bubble masks or whatever, and not enjoying their life. So we have to deal with some of this stuff, but common sense goes into a lot of this. Stay away from people who have colds, maybe wear a mask, make sure you wash your hands, stay out of dusty environments. If you were a cigarette smoker, if you go back to it, not only are you crazy, but I'm taking it back with a dull, rusty spoon. I have little patience for that, as uh, some patients will tell you and most of my colleagues will tell you. But we're going to figure out a way of dealing with this. We have ways of treating viruses. We have ways of treating inflammation. You're going to hear about one of my pet theories here soon. We don't have very good anti-scar drugs or anti-fibrosis drugs. We're looking at all kinds of things that are being used for other scarring processes that we can either inhale or we can give orally to try and slow this down and make this line go up here like this. But what you can expect from a transplant, overall, you generally will not require oxygen. You should be able to do pretty much whatever you want to do. We always tell people that unless you're a world-class athlete, you generally can't tell the difference between a single or a double. Now, if you go sit up on top of Pikes Peak, you might be able to tell the difference, but a lot of people going up to Pikes Peak can tell the difference, even if they don't have lung disease. You know, I mean, it's, it's a fact of altitude. So generally, the patients do very well. In terms of survival, we feel very comfortable telling them that they have about a 50 to 60% chance of living five years. 
if we do nothing and we don't transplant you, chances are you're probably going to live five years. But if you become very debilitated, that's going to get worse and worse and worse, and you're going to have less functional quality of life. And then it comes down to an individual decision. You have to decide, are the risks of transplant worth it to have that increase, the marked increase in functional activity? So I can tell you that if everything goes well, you're going to be fairly functional. The problem is, is that I can't tell you how long. Now, having said that, we have 10, 15, 20-year survivors, and a number of patients have done very, very well with this. So it is possible to take this line and pull it all the way out here. Uh, but with the entire group, you know, these are what the current statistics still are. If you look by the indication for transplant, you can see that different diseases have different outcomes. The pulmonary hypertension patients tend to do the worst because they have more problems with their heart early on, but we're getting a lot better at that. I'm going to call your attention here to the uh, red line. This is plain old COPD. The blue is alpha-1, and as you can see, there's a slight difference in the early first year. However, they catch up fairly rapidly around three years. Um, when we're thinking about people who, with alpha-1 who need a transplant, we're looking for people who have lung function less than 20% of normal, unless they have some of those other things I was talking about, pulmonary hypertension, bronchiectasis, uh, bad bugs uh, that are getting harder to treat. Uh, those would all be uh, indications for transplanting earlier than less than 20%. Uh, patients should be on oxygen continuously. They have to have failed maximal medical therapy, and they are not candidates for LVRS because, again, we would rather stage this. Do the volume reduction first, follow the transplant later, hopefully years down the road. I put age less than 70-ish because this is becoming a moving target. When we first started out, we felt that we should probably be transplanting alphas up to about age 65 or so. As we started doing more patients, we realized, and 65 is looking younger and younger every day <laughs> to a lot of us, um, that, you know, that's not that big of a deal. So we have a lot of people that are 70 years old who are actually fairly good physical specimens, and they can tolerate the procedure just fine, as long as they don't have a lot of other medical problems. So we're a little bit looser on this number than we used to be. Contraindications, obviously, if you're still smoking, you know, we're not going to have a discussion. If you're on the waiting list, we're going to test you. If we catch you, you're off the list for six months. If we catch you a second time, that's it. You're out of the program. And again, you already heard my thoughts about post-transplant smoking. Um, if you can't rehab, you're probably not going to do very well. Um, you have to be able to get up and start moving right after the transplant. If you have systemic infections, um, those are going to get worse with the immunosuppression. If you're infected in your lung because you have bronchiectasis, that's no different than a cystic fibrosis patient. So we will most likely transplant that patient with a double lung, depending on what organisms they have. Some of them just can't be treated with the regular antibiotics that we have. Um, if you have other severe medical problems, such as cirrhosis, uh, severe uh, kidney disease, severe heart disease, those would all be contraindications. If you're young enough, we could do a combined lung-liver. We've only done that one time for somebody with cystic fibrosis, but we've looked at several alphas who uh, had uh, far advanced liver disease, but their lungs weren't sick enough, and so we made a different decision. And then again, age greater than 70-ish. Uh, the controversies remain, should we do one or should we do two? What about the allocation system? We're not going to discuss that. Post-transplant augmentation therapy, I will spend some time discussing. Um, so if you look at the, uh, uh, the outcomes of emphysema versus alpha-1, and you stratify this by the type of procedure. So now this is all patients that got double lungs, shown in green and shown in red. You'll see that they don't do as well if they have alpha-1 in the first year compared to the emphysema patients. It's the same thing with the single lungs. It's not quite as wide a split, and they eventually catch up out here around four years or so, and the lines cross. So it seems like there's something different about the alpha-1 patients early post-transplant. And I'll show you some data here soon uh, about why that might be. Now, this was a, a person uh, with alpha-1 who unfortunately collapsed the lung, uh, the native side, in the operating room, 
The lung then got very, very big. It's actually over here somewhere, and it's completely squished the new lung transplant. So we had to put in a tube that went down both sides of the airway, two separate ventilators. We were able to kind of blow this lung up, let this one kind of you know, deflate quite a bit. This eventually completely expanded. We were able to switch the tube over. The patient ultimately did fine and didn't have anything you know, related to this, even though it looked really bad coming out. And I mean, when you see this as the first chest x-ray, you know it's gonna be a really long night. This is what happens chronically sometimes, and we've seen this particularly in the alpha-1 patients. This is the right lung becoming hyperinflated, and it goes all the way out over here. And so what that does is it eventually squishes the graft down here at the base, so that when you need to breathe a lot, like when you exercise or when you're sick, like if the graft was sick, this lung would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Or we also found some patients stopped taking their COPD meds because they felt so good after the transplant, they didn't need it. Well, this lung still has COPD. And so it got bigger and bigger and bigger, squashed the lung. We had to go in and do a volume reduction on this side um, to take out the excess amount of tissue that was just filled with air and was basically useless. This shifted back over, the graft re-expanded, and they had normal exercise function after this. Um, we looked at our own data of doubles versus singles. And you can see in green, doubles for alpha ones are up here. Singles for alpha one are down here. Following 2001, we said enough is enough. We figured this out. We're gonna do double lungs for all alpha patients that are under a certain age. And at this point in time, this was about 65 years old. For the doubles and the singles for COPD, it looks like there's a difference here, but really, you know, it's a small number of patients and they come back together out here at about four years. And it was unusual to have 100% survival in the uh, double lung uh, for emphysema group. They might have been a lot younger, that could have been something related to it, or we were just really, really good for those four years. Um, so based on this, we changed our algorithm. We now do doubles for all alphas less than age 65. Um, double lung for COPD is some here less than 60, maybe up to 63 now. But we will go up to age 70 if you have pulmonary hypertension, bronchiectasis, which puts you at risk for re infection, if we leave that behind. If you're a really tall male, it's hard to find tall donors. And if you have severe large bilateral uh, bullae, you know, if we only replace one side, you're gonna see that hyperinflation and the graft compression that I showed you on that x-ray. Um, so now going back to what happens to alphas specifically. Um, it's been known for a long time. This is data from the uh, 90s from St. Louis. You can see here's regular COPD and here's alpha-1. Again, you see this difference of about 5 to 10 percent somewhere out here around one year. If you look at the chronic rejection that patients develop, there really isn't that much difference, which was kind of surprising to me. You know, it suggests that there's something else that's accounting for the survival difference. Now maybe it's because alphas don't tolerate rejection as well. Maybe they don't tolerate uh, infections as well. Maybe it's because they're too inflamed. But if they were, I would think that this line, oops, would have started separating out in terms of chronic rejection. So maybe there's so much inflammation that they just don't do very well acutely and they don't live long enough to really see the chronic rejection. We don't really know though. Um, there's recent data from the Cleveland Clinic with uh, more patients, 45 out of uh, 231 with uh, COPD. And they found that there was no difference in the lung function measured by FEV1, no difference in the amount of acute rejection, and no difference in survival. However, when they broke the groups out, and you look at only the double lung transplants, here's a regular COPD, here's the alpha ones. Again, you see this difference between the two lines. So this suggests that there really is some difference between the alpha patient undergoing a double lung and uh, a regular COPD patient undergoing a double lung. This is old data from Toronto, 2004. Same difference. COPD is up here, alpha one down here. These guys went on to do a lot of these bronchoscopies that um, Dr. Sandhouse was talking about, which bronx are normal part of the post-transplant uh, uh, testing so you know we can measure all this stuff. What they found was that patients with alpha-1 were dying of something called sepsis, 
or overwhelming infections, almost twice as much as patients that were uh, normal COPDers. So again, this suggests that there's ongoing inflammation or there's excessive inflammation in the alpha-1 group. So the question is, is can we improve outcomes post-transplant? And the, uh, the ways of looking at this is we can give augmentation replacement therapy. Do we give it to just the alphas? Uh, do we give it to all COPD patients since they have airway disease as well? Or do we give it to everybody who's undergone a lung transplant? Uh, do we give it intravenously, like uh, most of you probably take it? Or do we give it inhaled directly to the airways, which is where the problem is after a lung transplant? Can we use it early to prevent what we call reperfusion injury? Or will, can we give it at times of acute rejection or infections when there may be a lot of inflammation in the lungs? Um, this is data from Wisconsin, which again was in uh, early 2000s. This shows that the levels of alpha-1 antiprotease in the lung in the uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid goes down significantly within the first four to six weeks following the transplant. Now what's interesting is that you see it in the alphas. It tends to be a lot lower. In emphysema without alpha-1, it still goes down. But interestingly, even in the cystic fibrosis population, you'll see that it goes down markedly over the first four to six weeks. So again, this would suggest to me that maybe all indications for transplant have this problem in their lung and that they all need replacement. Even though they have normal blood levels, the levels may not be normal in the lung or in the airway, and perhaps maybe we should consider inhaling it. Um, if you look at the number of white blood cells, which we think are the cells that are causing a lot of this inflammation, after we reperfuse the lung at, you know, within the first two weeks, there's a 157-fold increase in the number of cells. With severe rejection, it's 46 times. With certain infections like fun fungi or viruses, 60-fold increase. If you have a bacterial infection, it's 253. And if you've developed chronic rejection where there's a lot of ongoing inflammation, 232 times. Now, a lot of transplant physicians, and some of you may be in the audience, uh, are patients, if you start to develop chronic rejection, a lot of physicians will start you on augmentation therapy at that time. I would argue that the horse is out of the barn and running around right here, and that maybe what we ought to do is we ought to intervene back up here or here at the time of infection or rejection. This is a study uh, in a patient with alpha-1 uh, post-transplant that had uh, the compound inhaled. And you can see that uh, the drug gets out to sort of the peripheral airways, not quite as well as in the normal situation, but it's not bad. So we think we can deliver these drugs to where they need to go. Um, now, what about the donor organ shortage? So only about 15% of lungs uh, provide a suitable lung. They're very delicate organs, as you heard Sandy say. They're not a bag of cells like the liver. Um, I hope there are no hepatologists here. But uh, anyway, lungs are very, very hard to get for transplantation. Um, they can also get injured very easily, and this is what we call reperfusion injury. These, these should be black, but they're white because they're filled with fluid. And this can cause a lot of problems in terms of how long the patient needs to stay in the ICU. And unfortunately, a small number of patients actually die because the lungs just don't, didn't work right. When we go out to look at lungs, we look at the oxygen in the blood. Generally, it's greater than 300. The chest x-ray is usually looking pretty good. We may do, a, we always do a bronchoscopy to make sure there isn't a lot of secretions. And then we look at the lungs themselves to make sure that there isn't anything funny like a tumor or a big bruise if they were involved in uh, some sort of trauma or that they're not overly edematous or wet. Um, but what we can do is we can do what we call ex vivo lung perfusion where we can take the lungs out of the donor, we put them in this sterile egg, if you will, we can cannulate both the vein and the artery. This is a breathing tube that's sewn into the trachea, and you can see the lungs are being inflated. I don't know if it projects, but there's a red blotch right here. That's probably a bruise. So we can put the lungs on this rig, and we can watch them for up to four to six hours to see how they function. If they improve, then we can put them in the patient. If they don't improve, it tells us they wouldn't have worked if we had put them in. 
So we would just walk away at that point and say, we're not doing this operation tonight. Um, this is a case of uh, the first ex vivo we did in Colorado. You can see we can, we can x-ray the lungs. So we can look to see whether or not there's pneumonia or not. And I can tell you that since you can see all the little blood vessels, this is pretty normal. Um, the pulmonary function, you don't need to know about, except it's basically normal. The, the compliance of the lung is good, meaning that it inflates and deflates normally. Um, we did a trial with these other centers called the Novell trial. And what we found was that the risk of severe reperfusion injury went from 19% to 11%. There were no change in infections, rejection, or scarring of the, uh, the airway anastomosis. There was no difference in lung function at one year and no difference in 30-day or one-year survival. Now, I'll tell you that in this trial, we were only allowed to use lungs that had been turned down by every transplant center in the United States. So these were lungs that would not have been used. But by putting them on the rig, even though the FDA doesn't allow us to use the word recondition, we, we did use, we did R them, and they got better, and we were able to implant them, and we did it safely because there was no difference in survival or lung function. So this allowed us to increase the number of lungs that were available for transplantation, and so we were able to save more lives. Now the question is, is can we take normal lungs or abnormal lungs, and can we tweak them in certain ways to where we can make them better, to where this reperfusion injury goes way down, maybe we can do something to them to where they don't reject. Sandy talked about stem cells. We have some ideas about what kind of cells we can infuse while they're on the rig. Maybe we can do all kinds of things to these things before uh, we put them in. One such example of this, again from the Toronto group, is using uh, alpha-1 antiprotease. And so what they did is they took uh, some lungs, and this is uh, the oxygenation in the untreated group. This is in the treated group, and as you can see, the oxygen function went way, way up at both 30 minutes and at four hours. Um, if you look over here at the lung compliance, where the lungs are less stiff, again, here's control at 30 minutes and four hours, better at 30, better at, at four hours, which meant that the water in the lungs, when they were injured, is probably out of there, and the lungs are working at a much better uh, uh, function than they were without any treatment. So this is an example of drug therapy while they're on the rig, and it's interesting that uh, alpha-1 antiprotease does this. So again, decreasing inflammation probably improves the function of the lungs. Um, whether we do this on the rig, or whether we do this at the time of infusion, or we do it after you've been transplanted every uh, week or so, you know, to target a certain level, that's what we're trying to figure out now. Liver transplant, I won't say much about, except that it, it does improve lung function. A lot of people that have severe cirrhosis, they may have ascites where they have a lot of fluid in their belly, if you take all that fluid out after a transplant, it allows the diaphragms to work better, lung function improves, it's purely mechanical. The other thing that's interesting though, is that if you look at patients undergoing liver transplant for alpha-1, in some of them their lung function improves about 44%, 26%. Uh, some of the others though, it's either unchanged or it's not declining as fast. So maybe this is an in vivo rapid trial, if you will you know, where you give them back the protein and the, the emphysema slows down in its progression. In any case, I get patients sent a lot saying, you know, they have emphysema, they need a liver transplant, should we do it? My answer is generally yes, as long as they don't have, you know, really severe emphysema, because I think the majority of them are gonna go up about 25% or so. Maybe just from a mechanical standpoint, but I also feel comfortable that they're not gonna rapidly progress and go downhill as the ones that went downhill here, you know, with the exception of one of them that went down 8%, the majority of them stay the same, and that's probably because they have normal protein floating around after a liver transplant. So that, that's all I'm gonna really say about liver transplant at this point. Um, if you haven't signed your donor cards, please do. Make sure your relatives and uh, family and friends do, because we need more organs. Thank you very much. More motorcycles? Yeah. <laughs> we, we do. So the question was, with an LVRS, if you take out 
20 to 30 percent from the top, how does the lung move into that space? It's purely mechanical, the diaphragm just pushes it up. Now, if the lung is compressed, like I showed you in that giant bulla, that will re-expand. And so we know that some of that happens with an LVRS, but the majority of it is the diaphragm pushing up and filling the space. Sometimes the space doesn't fill and we actually have to kind of tweak the chest wall a little bit to get it to, to fill up so that there are no problems. No, they, just, they take their regular COPD medications because you still have emphysema, it's still going to progress. If you're on augmentation, you continue it. If you're using inhalers, you continue it. That's been the biggest problem with it is that so many patients feel much better that they don't think that they need to take their meds anymore. And then the emphysema progresses and they're right back to where they were. But we've seen patients go seven to 10 years after an LVRS that did not require transplant. In my experience, I'd say most of them go about three to seven years before we have to transplant them. So the question is, is how does LVRS change longevity? That slide that I showed was the time to needing a transplant or needing a listing for transplant. We've looked at the data of the two arms of the NET trial, and if you do, not, if you do no surgery, Generally, patients survive for you know, about two to three years after that when they started falling down to about you know, a 20% mortality rate. There was about a 15% mortality rate with the surgery. So it goes down fairly quickly, but then it stabilized out and somewhere out around two years or so, those lines crossed to where the surgery was better. But that was only in certain groups, which I showed you, the upper lobe, low exercise versus the diffuse group. Well, I think that in general, that's probably, oh, the, uh, the data showing that L, uh, alpha-1s may progress more rapidly than uh, COPD patients after LVRS. I mean, I think we have seen that. We've also seen the opposite where they didn't really decline at all. But again, the numbers are so small. But I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because you have a genetic form of emphysema where if you're not on augmentation from what we saw in rapid, you know, you're losing lung function. Um, that's why I think that the liver transplant data is kind of interesting, how stable the lung function stayed, you know, years after a liver transplant. So, um, you know, a lot of people probably wouldn't do LVRS for alphas, but I think that the more we can do, especially in younger patients, to prevent them from requiring a lung transplant, that's the best way to do it, and then we can come back and retransplant them when they definitely need it.